have been talking about the kind of church that God has sent into the world. What does he want his church to be like? What should the ministry of a church look like? Now, we've been in Acts uh, chapter 1 and 2, uh, 3. Uh, we're in chapter 4 today. Um, we're looking at uh, various aspects. We talked about that, that he wants his church to be a generous church, a joyful church, a, uh, a serving church, a caring church, a learning church. You know, sometimes we get uh, in our white-haired years and we think, all right, I know it. No, I don't know it. God knows everything, and all I know is that I don't know what he knows. Uh, his ways are not my ways, and his thoughts are not my thoughts. It's, it's important for us to be in the process of learning and growing so that God may make us more like Jesus. How are people going to see Jesus in us if we don't learn what Jesus is like and we don't yield ourselves to that influence, the sweet influence of the Holy Spirit of God working to conform us, as the old King James says, to conform us to the image of his Son. You read that in, in Romans chapter 8. God, uh, his plan was that Jesus might have many brethren, that he might have a large family, brethren and sistren together, all like him. You know, it's not that uh, you, we walk around in sandals and bed sheets with a beard. It's that inside and on our face and our attitude and our words and our behavior are like that of our eldest brother. Yes, we can actually say that Jesus is called the firstborn among many brethren. And that, that point is that he is the true uh, eternal son of God, but through faith in him, we become children of God. Of course, he is the firstborn, which means he's the head. Of course, he is Lord. He's more than just a brother. But Jesus even said to his disciples, I've called you friends. You're my friends. And any who choose to uh, respond to his call to, be, to follow him, they become his friends as well. That's why for years and years we have sung that song, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Now we're getting ready to go into a week of vacation Bible school. This is one of those all hands on deck week and uh, every person is appreciated and, and it's great to see folks show up like they do and the things are going on. You know, with the COVID, the, the unsocial distancing that we were afflicted with for so long, people have been scattered so much. It's good to see people gathered together. We, we tried to have vacation Bible school during the COVID time. We did, I mean, we spread them out six feet apart. We put them in big rooms and Oh, we had a one night, oh boy, the stuff we tried. We tried, but we're back, you know? Can we say, can, can, can we say, we're back, amen, amen? And I hope that uh, all that work that you've done, handing out those door knockers and those flyers and all those invitations that you have made, that many unchurched families, people that w walk up and say, what do y'all actually do at a church? I've never been in one before. Those are the ones I hope to see come, that they might taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, the question might come up, preacher, y'all spend thousands of dollars on this, don't you? Yeah, we do. Uh huh. And we're glad to do it. Because you see, this is important. So why is stuff like Vacation Bible School important? Well, in the last in my series, I'm going to talk about the kind of church that God wants to have. He wants his church to be a witnessing church. Now, witnessing, that's a word many people cringe and say, yeah, 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 okay. That means I have to say something, doesn't it? Well, actually, it does. Well, that means I, I have to put myself out of my comfort zone and, and, and talk to people about Jesus that might not want to hear about it. Well, actually, yes, it does. But before we go too far in that, I want to ask for a show of hands today. How many people in this room, your sins are forgiven, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, 
You have a reservation in heaven. Jesus is going to come take you home. The Holy Spirit lives inside you. You are a changed person. You have new character and new personality. You have new power that you never had before. You love like you never... All of these things because somebody stepped out of their comfort zone and told you about the most wonderful person they ever met. They told you about the most wonderful experience they ever experienced. How many people in this room would say, preacher, all those things are true about me because somebody did that for me? Can I see your show of hands? Yeah. Now, I do know there are few individuals, I've heard the testimonies, people that never went to church, never had a gospel witness, nobody ever even gave them a gospel track, and they ended up thinking about committing suicide, and of course, you'd be living an empty life if you never had any of the influence of the gospel in your life, and they are in a, in a hotel room, uh, ready to commit suicide, but they somehow felt compelled to open the drawer and pull out the Gideon Bible. It just happened to open up to the page that said, God God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And the Spirit of God took that verse and they realized, well, if God did that for me, I'm ready to trust in him. And they were saved right there on the spot. You know, there are those few people that that book brought them to Christ. But may I tell you, just in the case of those Gideon Bibles, those Gideons are witnesses for Jesus. They put those Bibles in those hotel rooms. They bought those Bibles to put in those hotel rooms. So you see, as Paul said in Romans chapter 10, we studied a few weeks ago in Brother Lee's class, he said, how can they hear the gospel? You know, the Bible says in just a few verses ahead of that, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're not going to be able to believe in Jesus if you don't hear something about him. How can you trust in him of whom you've never heard? That's the question asked by the apostle. And he says, how can they hear except somebody would tell it? And so may I tell you, please, essentially, the primary purpose of the church after the business of knowing God and living to glorify God, okay? So what should we be now that we know God and want to glorify God? We're supposed to be a witness. Brother Lee had a great discussion on this it's in another Sunday school class. I believe it was last week. No, it was in his preaching uh, last Sunday night. And he said, you know, I used to say, I am a carpenter. How many of you over here Sunday night? It was a good message. He said, I'm, I'm, but he said, I'm not a carpenter. Being a carpenter is what I do. And I say, he does it very well. He's an excellent carpenter. I worked with him for a year. He, he drives nails as good as anybody. He knows where to drive the nails. He knows where to put the boards to drive the nails in. He's really good. But he says, I'm not a carpenter. I do that. There he is. And he walks the door. Good. He didn't have to hear me bragging on him. No bragging on him anymore. But I really, and, and I do appreciate this. It's spoken to me several times this week. I am not a pastor. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a carpenter. I'm not a bus driver. I'm not a... I am an ambassador for Christ. And... Uh, you know, that's the cool thing. When God helps you to prepare, and God helps you with his anointing to speak, it does some good. It sticks with people. It makes a difference. It feeds their souls. Listen to me. You may do other things, but if you are a follower of Jesus, now you might not be a follower of Jesus. You may be one of those that think you got your fire insurance. Now you can just go your own way. Somehow I think those two things are mutually exclusive, but that's for another sermon. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are. You are. You are. Whether you do it or whether you're willing to do it or whether you're a good one or whether you're a bad one. Jesus said, this is kind of like the second great commission. The, the great commission as we know it is found in Matthew chapter, uh, what is it, 19 verse, no. Last chapter, 28. 28 verse 19, 18, 19, and 20. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. 
Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. That's the Great Commission. But the second Great Commission is in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He says, you shall receive power. See, that's the cool thing. We don't have to do this in our own strength. This business of witnessing. Can I, can I just tell you right now? I hate to initiate conversations about things that people don't want to talk about. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you understand where I'm coming from? Because people want to talk about, who is the two yo-yos arguing with each other this week? Um, Hollywood people arguing about who, who let sl slandered who or who libeled who and blah, 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 blah. I can't even remember the names, which is fine with me. People want to talk about that. They want to talk about the gas, of course. I, I talk about it a little bit too. $85 in my gas tank, that's something to talk about. But uh, they like to talk about anything. They don't want to talk about the living God. They don't want to talk about Jesus. Why? Because they already know that there's a distance between them and God. They already know, there's already written on the table of their heart that they have sinned and they have missed the mark and then they're not living up to a holy standard. So the whole idea of talking with somebody about God, you got two strikes against you because they already feel uncomfortable. They're coming into the situation as a beggar and we're Americans and we're proud and we don't like to be beggarly. And so we don't want to talk about it. And we'll just say, I'm not interested. All right, that's, that's your truth, not mine. You know, blah, 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 blah. But I'm telling you, why are you here? Why are you alive? Why is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Because somebody stepped out of their comfort zone and said, I'd really like to talk with you about something that you might not want to talk about. Matter of fact, that's a good way to talk to people about Jesus. To ask them permission, say, would you mind if you, if you gave me two minutes and allowed me to tell you something that you might not want to hear? Because they know they don't want to hear it, and you know they know that they don't want to hear it. But sometimes you can ask people and they can think, yeah, I can handle anything for two minutes. Yeah, go ahead. I remember a conversation that started out that way back in uh, July of 1972. And I had friends, and the people that I hung out with were people that didn't talk about God. But one of my friends had a friend that loved God. He loved Jesus. He was born again. He was saved. He was not only a saved believer, but he was what you'd call a genuine, bona fide soul winner. It was just his nature. He loved God, and he loved people. He was just oh, a couple of years older than I was. He was about 19 years old, getting ready to go to Bible college. He was a friend of my friend, and he just happened to be there that day at the house. And he said, can I tell you about what Jesus did for me? And I know who I was at that time, and I knew my attitude, what I was like at that time. And I said something to the effect I'm not interested in that, and I would have words for it that, that I don't want to repeat today. I'm not interested. You know, I, that's your thing, not mine. And he asked me, he said, you might not know what God is really like. Would you let me tell you about what God did for me? And I said, well, you know, I'm naturally curious. And of course, in the back of my mind, I think, I went to church as a kid, and I turned that stuff down. I, I chose to be an atheist. I turned my back on God. I walked away from anything that had to do with God. And for obvious reasons, I wanted to drink and smoke and carry on like my, all my other friends. And I, if, I figured if there was a God, I got to an answer to him. So I'm just going to, I'm going to imagine him away. That's basically what atheism is. It's, it's, ref, it's refusing the fact of the reality that the heavens declare the glory of, of God. Just look at any sunset. Oh, yeah, God made that. That's too big for accidental stuff. Anyway, to make this story short, he talked for a few minutes, and it, it, and it got my dander up. I thought, well, I'm going I'm to show him. I'm going to show him how stupid he is. I'm going to show him how wrong he is, how foolish this whole thing is. And I argued with him. Well, he had answers for every one of my arguments. And they were true. And I couldn't deny them. And it made me matter. And I just kept trying to come up with stuff. And that two minutes ended up being a long time. 
Now, I'd like to say, and he got through to me, and I trusted in Jesus, and it changed my life. But it didn't. But it stuck in my craw because he told me the truth. See, this is what witnessing is about. How many of you know that if you're going to be a faithful witness, you are not responsible for the outcome? You're not. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how people are going to respond. You don't know if you pull up to an intersection. You know, if you smile at somebody, they might just turn around and shoot you anymore. I mean, it's the thing. you don't know what's coming. God didn't make us responsible for the outcome, but God did make us responsible. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1-8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you shall be, you shall be, that's what we are. That's what we be in the old vernacular. We be that. Be witnesses unto me. Witnesses unto me. Now, I got a lot of stories hanging out here. <laughs> to kind of finish the one story, the witness of this young man that was a friend of my friend stuck in my craw, and I was going off on my world tour some friends and I got together and jumped in a hippie van and took out across America. And I never stopped thinking about what this guy had said. Ended up about two weeks later on a mountain in New Hampshire. And I never experienced such beauty and such peace in my life. And the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, I made that. Do you want to know me? You see, he had primed my pump. This young man, the stuff he said stuck in my craw. His witness to me began to open up avenues of understanding that I had refused to consider before. I reacted to him. Listen to me. People are going to react to you. We're going to read the text here, and you're going to find out that they reacted to Simon Peter too. Cancel culture is not new. It's been around forever. But the witness that was faithful paved the way. First, I... I, I, the, a week before that, I was on a beach. I told you in uh, near St. Augustine, a place called Potavidra, my first real prayer. I said, God, if you're real, would you show yourself to me? And I just forgot about it and went on. And a few weeks later, I was on that mountain in New Hampshire, and the Spirit of God said, "There's this. I made this. You want to know me? I came down off that mountain and said, you know what? i got to find out who God is. I still didn't want to believe that it was Jesus because Jesus has rules. You can't drink and smoke and carry on and do those things. I've got to find me another God. Well, I did. I tried to, I read every religion. I read the, I can't even pronounce it, Bhagavad Gita or how, how, do you, how do you pronounce that thing? I read that sorry book from cover to cover. It had nothing for me. And all that I found in the religions of the world was work harder, work smarter, work longer, and maybe you can achieve something. That didn't work. This was not the only witness that came to me. During that period of time, I had a very good friend who used to be one of my hippie buddies who owned a sub shop in the town that I lived in. He called it the Yellow Submarine. <laughs> and he said, I gotta tell you what happened to me. Well, I knew this guy, he was cool. He was cool. He was two years ahead of me in high school, you know, they're always cooler than you are because they're older than you are. They got cars before you do. You know, they're cool. And he came to my house and he sat in the chair. I never will forget sitting in that old chair. It was green. And he was always larger than life. He just always did this when he talked. He said, wow, man, I was washing dishes in my restaurant and all these Baptists next door, the church next door, used to come in and eat sandwiches and try to talk to me about Jesus. He said, I was washing dishes one night after closing and he said, God came to me. And he said, I prayed and Jesus changed my life. And I said, a week later, another friend said to me, Hey, there's a, a cool Jesus gathering. One of the churches in the area, they, they tried to reach us people that thought we were too cool to go to a church. They had this out on the parking lot. And my friend had seen the advertisement for it in the underground newspaper. You know, boy, that's outreach. And uh, he said, let's go. I said, okay, that's cool. 
It sounds cool, Jesus gathering. That didn't sound like formal church. And I got there and it was on a church parking lot. I thought, I ain't going in there, that's a church. I ain't going in there. I still was fighting it, you know. And he said, well, it's outside. No, oh, my wife was there, she's the one that said that. She said, it's outside. If you just want to leave, we can leave. But after all of these different people, now I, I had to include the ones way back in high school that, that I remember when I picked up a girl from the airport, she had flown back down to bury her parents. And she was a firm believer and in the midst of her sorrow, I was the only one that had the day off that day and I was glad to drive to the airport and pick her up. But on the way back from the airport, she witnessed to me of the everlasting life that she trusted in, that her mom and dad were saved and she knew one day she'd see them again. All of these people that witnessed to me, Sunday school teachers when I was a kid, that I turned my back on. Parents that tried to teach me the right way. But that night, on that parking lot, that last witness, the one that brought the icing to the cake. I don't even know the name of the guy, but he stood on the platform and he preached Jesus. He preached Jesus crucified and buried and resurrected, dying for my sins, paying my price, rising for my justification, and offering to me and to everybody on the planet a free gift of life and forgiveness and peace and hope. And I could go on forever. And the Spirit of God said, now you know who I am. Come trust me. As I walked forward, they gave an old-fashioned invitation, and I came forward, and I took the preacher by the hand. I said, I don't know how to do this, but I want Jesus. And they led me, and I prayed, and I told you the rest. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Witnessing is what we are. And we can do it poorly. And we can do it rarely, or we can do it willingly. And the Spirit of God can work through us. And some of the most unlikely people can be the linchpin to make something wonderful happen, like it happened to me. Acts chapter 4, verse 1 through 22, let me read it. Now, what happened before this was that there was a man laid at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate. He'd been lame for 40 years. He had never walked in his life. Peter and John came up to the temple. They were poor as church mice. They had no money, but they gave what they got. As a matter of fact, may I tell you, I love the title of Paul Little's book, How to Give Away Your Faith. Simon Peter said, silver or gold, I have none, but such as I have, I will give you. Simon Peter had faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the man took Peter by the hand, and you know what he did? He rose up and he walked, and he didn't just walk, he jumped up and down. And thousands of people in that area came into that section of the temple. They followed them in. This guy's just jumping up and down, praising God. And boy, you talk about a witness. He was a witness. And uh, uh, by the way, 5,000 people got saved that day. Five. That was only 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. 5,000 today. And so, uh-oh, the priest, the Pharisees, the chief council, we got to stop this. We pick up in verse 1 of chapter 4. And as they spoke unto the people, that is Peter and John, preaching about Jesus, and boy did they preach about Jesus. The priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved. They were ticked off. They were unhappy that they were preaching Jesus. They were grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. See, it's not just about the healing. The healing was just the invitation the, the contemporary evidence of the reality of the living God so that people could experience the greater gift, which is the gift of eternal life. And so Peter and John didn't just preach, this is healing, this is healing, this is healing. They said, no, this healing is in the name of Jesus. And let me tell you about Jesus. He's the one you rejected. He's the one you nailed to the cross. He's the one came out of the grave, and he's the one that can forgive you and give you life. They preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead, and they laid hands upon them. They, they didn't tap them. They didn't lay hands on them and pray for them. They grabbed them by the collar, and they drug them out of there. They wanted to stop this people preaching Jesus. 
and they put him in hold until the next day. Let's quiet him up, for it was eventide. Howbeit, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. That's 5,000 men that were there. I don't know how many women and children, you know, more, usually more women and children uh, around, anyway. Uh, a lot of people. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and their elders and their scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and remember those names, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? I mean, they were the religious leaders. They felt we're responsible. We better check this out. I mean, this guy's been lame for 40 years. We've never been able to help him at all. And all of a sudden, he is totally, t totally healed, jumping up and down, praising God. How did you do that? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. And by the way, can I tell you this? I'm not going to have time. Let's just say it briefly. If you are willing to be a witness God is willing to fill you with his Holy Spirit. If you've ever experienced that before in your life, would you say amen? amen? Wow. There's a number of witnesses in this room of things that they have seen and heard. So filled with the Holy Spirit, Simon Peter uh, stands up and he says to them, you rulers of the people, you elders of Israel, if this, what, this day we be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man and by what means he is made whole, oh, okay, if you're asking, let me tell you, be it known unto you all and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I'll tell you what, before I came to Jesus, I used his name as a cursed word. But now I speak his name in reverence and love. And Simon Peter did that day. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you complete. This is the stone, speaking of Jesus, which is set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. He's the chief cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, by the way, if you allow yourself to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you will have the boldness you need to do what you need to do. Listen, don't expect to work it up from within yourself. If you're going to be a faithful witness, don't expect to do it on your own. Expect to do it with God's leading and expect to do it with God's power. And we'll talk about what it means to be a witness. We'll, we'll move quickly. Let's get through the rest of this passage. Uh, so they, they saw the boldness and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They spoke with a Galilean accent. They were fishermen. Their pronunciation was not, you know, real, highly educated pronunciation. They probably said ain't and never know and stuff like that. You know, they just, that they were just common working people. They weren't language majors. They didn't study Hebrew in college. They took note that they were unlearned and, and ignorant men. You see, to the Pharisees, it was all about, you know, becoming a theologue at some cemetery school. And uh, that's usually what happens in some of these dead seminaries. And so, and so uh, they said, uh, we notice that you're unlearned and ignorant men. They're, they're saying this among themselves. Um, they marveled, and, but they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I'd love to park there for about an hour, but can I just take one minute? Do you spend enough time alone with Jesus? These guys have spent three and a half years alone with Jesus. And these guys had spent 10 days in an upper room alone praying. Do you spend enough time alone with Jesus that the impression that you leave on people when they walk away is they must have been with Jesus. Now, yeah, I know. They recognized they were the disciples. They were with Jesus. But there was something about them that reminded them that they had been with Jesus. Can I tell you, I read the other day that 
Marie Curie. You remember Marie Curie? She was such a leading uh, physicist and she learned so much about uh, radiation. As a matter of fact, it probably killed her. It, it, it weakened her, her husband and probably weakened her that they both died of, of uh, the effects of radiation poisoning. Did you know that her notes and her tools from her laboratory are off limits and put aside and for 1500 years nobody's going to be able to handle those things you know why because they've been around that radiation so much they're still radioactive and they expect another 1500 years these tools and these books are going to be radioactive so what's that got to do with me preacher have you been with Jesus enough to be radioactive for at least 10 minutes when you walk away from his presence? Maybe an hour, maybe half a day, maybe a whole week. You've spent time with him. You know, when Moses was up on the mountain getting the law from God there as they got ready to go into the promised land, when Moses was in the presence of God 40 days, you know what happened? That man came down from the mountain and he was, his face was glowing. It scared everybody. They said, put something over your face. You're scaring us. Have you been with Jesus long enough? You see, this is what makes a witness a witness. You speak the things you've seen and heard and experienced. You don't just make up a spiel and try to convince people like a used car salesman. To be a witness is just telling the truth as you have read it and experienced it. And when we spend time with Jesus, people are going to say, you got something I want. You got something I want. I don't have what you got. You've been with Jesus. Now, they also noticed that the man was healed. <laughs> yeah, we've seen that guy laying at the temple there 40 years. He's been coming. Somebody's been bringing him, laying him by that temple. And he hadn't walked in 40 years. And they beheld the man which was healed standing with them. And they could say nothing against it. And brother, you better believe they would have said something against it. But they couldn't argue with the facts. I look around the room and I see people that have experienced a changed life. And your changed life is powerful evidence of a living God. That's a part of being a witness, is letting God change you. Letting God work that selfish, angry impatience out of you and replacing it with his love and his kindness and his mercy and his compassion. That's part of being a witness. It's saying, here, God, I'm an old ugly lump of clay. Put me on your potter's wheel. Put your sweet, creative hands on me and change me. Change me from the inside out. Fill me with your spirit. Make me like your son. This man was different. They couldn't argue. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? we got to shut them up. Remember, these are the guys that were jealous of Jesus. What are we going to do with these men? For that indeed a notable miracle, miracle has been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. <sighs> Did you know that there is a revival taking place in the world today? Not here. We got churches splitting to go follow wickedness and blasphemy. We have whole denominations that are getting flushed into the cesspool of history. But in places like China, places like Indonesia, places like Saudi Arabia, there's revival taking place because people are living a life that is proving the reality of Jesus Christ. But there'll always be people who are jealous of it. They said in verse 17, but that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. You've got to stop talking about Jesus. And so they called him and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I've never waved a red flag in front of a bull. But I understand that wiggling that thing does, it doesn't matter what color it is, but you wave that thing in front of him, he wants to charge it. He does. Well, these people have just waved a red flag in front of Peter and John because it's like, 
Okay, guys, you know Jesus is, is the one that, that we've been looking for, that the prophets foretold, the one who took our sins to the cross, who rose from the dead, who's totally changed our lives, who we love with our entire heart. We're ready to die for him if it's necessary. You're expecting us not to preach in the name of Jesus. And, oh, okay. They called him. They threatened him. And Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to obey you more than to obey God, you figure it out. Please, take those words to heart. Because as I said, cancel culture is not new, but it's prevalent today. We have a very anti-God society. They won't cancel you. It's happening every day. It's going to keep happening until Jesus comes back. Don't moan over it. Don't whine over it. Just recognize it's going to be there, but God is bigger than they are. And Peter and John just simply said, guys, what you're asking us to do is to obey you rather than God. Now, you figure out whether that's the best thing to do or not for you. But, or excuse me, it says four. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. May I tell you that many people are not a witness because they have never seen it or heard it. They've never experienced it. They've come forward. They've prayed a sinner's prayer. You know, praying doesn't save you. Believing saves you. Confessing Jesus as Lord saves you. Praying a prayer that's just a religious exercise. They, they come and they, they pray a prayer. They get baptized, homogenized, ba and pasteurized, made a part of the church. Here's a book, teach a Sunday school class. And they're just as lost as that golf ball that you just hit in that deep pond. People don't witness because maybe they haven't experienced it. But those who have, there's something inside them that wants to get out. You ever read that passage in scripture? I believe it's in either first or second Timothy where Paul says, work out your own salvation. In other words, you already got it inside you. Now let it come on out. Let it work on out in your attitudes, in your a conversation, in your values and your goals and how you set your agenda. Work it out. Don't let it, don't hide it under a bushel. Put it up on a lampstand. So he says, all right, y'all you, you, just judge that. But we cannot help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them and they let them go, finding nothing how they should punish them because of the people, because <laughs> they knew if they punished them, the people were, were going to take up arms against them. You see, it was all just old-fashioned political jealousy on their part. But they threatened them anyway. They saw that all men had glorified God for what was done for the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Quickly, let me make some points and we'll be done. Jesus said, be my witness. This is who we are. We are his representative. We are his ambassador. And Peter said, we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. Those who are in Christ are new creatures and we are created in Christ unto good works. The whole business of being born again, the whole business of God recreating in me a new life enables me to be a witness. He changed me from being an enemy of the cross to a proclaimer of the cross. And it is his creative power that works in us. Jesus calls his people the salt of the earth. That means flavor. And we should be walking salt. The salt of his character should affect how we live our daily lifestyle. And we should also be talking salt. I hear those that say, you know, be a witness. And if you have to say something, listen to me. You should first live the life. But as you live the life, you've got to speak. Because how shall they hear except there be a preacher? That's the central argument. That's why Jesus didn't call us to be just models for the world. He called us to be witnesses to the world. 
even in this generation in which people are falling away and churches are dying and their properties are being sold and denominations are flushed into the cesspool of history, God's people can rise up and be faithful and we can be a witnessing church. And when that happens, you know what happens? People get saved. Now, the word saved might not mean a whole lot to you unless you happen to be the one drowning in the middle of the Caribbean Sea and you see the Coast Guard helicopter come. Then saved means everything to you. You may be the guy that falls through the ice and the, the person that crawls out there with a rope. Saved means something to you. You may be pinned in an automobile in an accident and start smelling smoke. And that fireman that comes out there with that jaws of life and that saw, saved means something to you. And if you're born a sinner in Adam's race and you know you are death doomed and you are going out into a Christless eternity, then all of a sudden saved means something to you. And how shall they know unless somebody tells them? I came to the place in my life that I was convinced that I was just like a dog. I lived my life and when I was dead, that was the end of it. And I'll go into the dirt. You know why? Because somebody witnessed to me of that lie. And I said, I want to believe that because now I can do as I please. Now I can be my own master. There's nobody I have to answer to. We come to people and we tell them there is a God and there is a Savior, but we must repent of our sins, turn from our sins to Him. He cleans us up. We don't clean up ourselves. He cleans us up. But we must turn to Him in order to do that. It doesn't feel good when you tell people that. But when you tell them that He will receive them, He will love them, and if they're listening, they'll hear the Spirit of God speaking to their heart, saying to them the same thing that you're speaking out of your mouth. Maybe they'll react to you like I did to that friend of a friend. And maybe later on down the road, maybe years later, they'll come to Christ. But the important thing is you sowed the seed. You were a faithful witness. A witness in the New Testament sense is one who is completely dedicated to representing his Lord no matter the cost. The word witness in the Greek New Testament is martyris. That's where we get the word martyr. You see, a witness is a person who's put it all on the line. I don't care what people say about me. I care about them knowing God. Maybe they'll hear it. And this is what a witness is, willing to patiently face the opposition. And so they went on and they taught the people and they preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. I told you cancel culture is not new. The ringleaders, you, you saw the list of those who were jealous and hated Jesus. They were united in opposition to Jesus. They didn't have any answers for the problems of the world. They just had opposition to Jesus. They were grieved that they were preaching Jesus. They saw the man that was healed, but they couldn't say anything about it but they still commanded the disciples to be quiet. This kind of stuff is going to keep going on. Don't let it ruffle your feathers. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but you know what else he said right then? Right at the end of that he said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know, being faithful can cause you moments or days or weeks of discomfort and temporal loss. I've lost jobs because of my faith in Christ. I have lost friends because of my faith in Christ. But I found out they weren't really friends. You see, telling the truth separates people from truth listeners and truth haters. There's always gonna be cancel culture. But the message of the witness is Jesus. An old preacher one time, and I'm, I'm about through, hang on. Old preacher told me one time, he says, son, Connie Hargrove, he was an old man from Kentucky. He was just the real deal. He was just, he, 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 he presided over our ordination when I was ordained as a deacon. And uh, he said, son, I, I think you're gonna be a preacher. I didn't know it at the time. It was two years later when I, I really knew God's call uh, for me to the ministry. Hey, he said, I think you're going to be a preacher, son. Let me give you a word of advice. He says, preach anywhere you want to in the Bible. Preach from Psalms. Preach from Genesis. Preach about marriage. Preach about economics. Preach. The Bible talks about all of it. But whatever you preach, 
in your message, you make a beeline to the cross. I'll never forget that phrase. Make a beeline. To, you know, bees go whoop to the hive. They got that nectar. They're ready to bring it back to the home. Make a beeline to the cross. That's what a witness does. We listen to people. We care about people. Don't be such a hurry to force your opinion on somebody else. Don't, don't do any buttonholing. Don't do this to people. Listen to them. Care about them. You've heard the phrase, it says it well. People don't care what we know until they know that we care. Show them that you care. But when they realize that you're interested in their eternal destiny, make a beeline to the cross because there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The reason I preach Jesus is because no one else can save. No one else. There is no other way. God did not design a plan B. It's Jesus or a Christless eternity. That's why I'm a witness. Because not only is he the only choice, he is the best choice. He is the choice. Peter explained the healing by Jesus. He explained everything by Jesus. Verse 19, and I'm closing. He told the, the, the council, all right, you guys, y'all argue about whether we should obey you more than God, but here's the bottom line. We are going to speak the things we've seen and heard. Y'all make up whatever story you want to. This is the truth. Y'all make up whatever law you want to. We're going to obey God. I close with these words of Simon Peter. The Holy Spirit gave him to write this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. You know what that means? That's a fancy way of saying, put God first in your life. Now, he'll help you do that. As a matter of fact, if you get still and quiet and you listen to him, you'll find out that he's knocking on the door to your heart and saying, you know what? If you'll let me be first in your life, I'll fix the mess that you've got there. I'll deal with your relationships. I'll deal with your financial issues. I'll deal with all of these things. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all this other stuff will be added to you. I'll give you all the other stuff. You know. I'm telling you something. I've walked with the Lord 48 years. And I've been poor. And I've been well off. And in both situations, I can say the same thing that Paul. I, I can be content in whatsoever state. Because God will take care of my needs. When we're poor, we'll eat grits. <laughs> and when we're doing well, we'll eat chicken. It's okay. But put first things first. He says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. There's an invitation. Have you sanctified the Lord God in your heart? If he doesn't occupy the first place, if he is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. The word Lord and the word no are mutually exclusive. If you're saying no to God, he's not Lord. Come and make that right. May I tell you that throughout my life, there's times that I've been saying no and he wasn't my Lord. And I had to get it right. I've had my ups and I've had my downs. You may be in the down right now. You come back to Jesus, he'll pick you up. Amen? He'll clean you up. He'll lift you up. But you've got to look up. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And be always ready. That means when you get up in the morning on Monday, you're going to work. Think about the fact that maybe going into the lunchroom, the break room, whatever they call it, and leaving an extra chair at the table, that that may be what God wants you to do that day. That somebody might sit at that table and you might talk about, how about them Braves? They're on a winning streak and one thing will lead to another and, and, and they'll talk about something on Sunday. You say, well, I, I go to church on Sunday and they look at you like, uh-oh, it's a Christian. And then you just say something like, yeah, Jesus has been so good to me. And they say, well, tell me about you. You know, they could just say, tell me about your Jesus. And you say, wow, how much time have you got? Be always ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. Are you ready to tell people what you're hoping in? 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Are you ready to explain the hope that is in you? One more time, I'm going to tell you this. There may be somebody here today. The reason you don't witness is because you don't have that hope. You've got cultural Christianity, but you've never been born again. Billy Graham said in his ministry that he thought that half of the members of the churches of this country were lost. And they went through the motions, but they didn't know Jesus. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I'd like to, I'd like to tell you the truth. You won't speak of the hope that is in you if you don't have that hope. And we do it with meekness and fear. If we're going to be a witness, we must speak the truth in love. And don't forget either one, to speak the truth or to speak it in love. 